1989's Celia is a rather unfortunate film. Unfortunate in its storytelling and distinctly unfortunate in its marketing. You see, this movie's been marketed incorrectly for years and it's totally frustrating when this happens because the marketing sets your expectations as to what you're about to sit down and watch. We don't live in a world where a movie is defined by its title and year of release alone, so when a company go out of their way to mislead consumers into thinking they're going to get a film from one genre, only then to have them wrong-footed and instead subjected to a completely different style of movie, well, at best it's going to be a surprise for the viewer, and at worst the viewer's going to be pissed off. I've had two of these incidents happen in the last six months. One being with Arrow Video's release of Season of the Witch, a psychological thriller that's been marketed as a straight horror movie due to its ties with George A. Romero, and Christopher's Christmas Mission, which was marketed by Abbey Home Video as a kid's film when in fact it was a teen-slash-adult film about socialism and the complex nature of giving selflessly. Celia is a drama with a few surreal elements thrown in. I'd struggle to call it a thriller because it really isn't. But in essence, this film's basically a period drama shown through the eyes of a child, and as such, there are some moments that are distorted to match the child's imagination. For example, Celia, our main protagonist, throughout the film is reading a novel about creatures who live in the woods and attack unknowing travellers based on folklore. As a result, at night, her imagination runs away with her, and she sometimes sees these creatures. But they aren't directly involved in the plot, they don't turn out to be real in any way, shape or form, and if I'm being blunt, they don't interact with the film outside of a little girl's occasional imaginary wanderings. This film has been marketed as a straight horror based purely on those elements of the film, and it has been marketed as such repeatedly over the last three decades. And it's not like they play up the non-existent horror but still mention the drama elements. Oh no, this film's promoted as a horror thriller. But there just isn't anything even remotely close to a horror film present here, in any way, shape or form. Apart from the nighttime imagination sequences, which happen about four to five times in 20 to 30 second bursts, and mild spoilers, an accidental murder that happens in the last 15 minutes of the film, there's nothing even remotely close to horror in this picture. Celia follows Celia, a young girl growing up in Australia during the winter of 1957. At this time there were two major things happening in Australia. There was a distinct amount of fear-mongering around the potential rise of communism within the country, and there was a massive problem involving a plague of rabbits that was massively impacting agriculture within the country. Celia's only real friend is her grandmother, and the film opens with her immediate death. Shaken and lonely, Celia retreats into a world of books and make-believe, which was a fairly easy job to do as she had a highly active imagination from the off. Celia only really wants two things in life, some friends and a pet rabbit of her own. When some new neighbours, the Tanners, move in next door, Celia's delighted and immediately makes friends with the family's children. But when word gets out that the Tanners are active members of Australia's Communist Party, the newly moved in family end up becoming social pariahs, and events are set in motion that will lead to attempted adultery, theft, and even murder, as Celia and her friends become the victims of bullying from older kids in the local police department. Tensions begin to rise, in what I can only describe as one of the most confusing and underwhelming films I've seen in a very long time. Right off the bat, while I like the story idea, its execution, pacing and narrative structure is just awful in my opinion. There's a really good idea buried somewhere in this movie, and I think that's what annoys me the most about it. Everything within this thing is so ephemeral, spoilers from here on in. The Tanner family, for example, offer a tremendous narrative nugget that really could have been analysed and developed a bit better. Not only do you have the communism angle to work with, but you also have the fact that once they're outed, the Tanner children basically become free targets for the local bullies and the father of the Tanner family is forced to leave his job or be fired because of his political beliefs. Adding into that that Celia's dad is an absolutely foul human being who's not only responsible for outing the Tanners on a wider scale, but actively was involved in getting the Tanners' father fired from his job, 
and he keeps trying to shag Mrs. Tanner, despite her blunt calls for him to fuck the fuck off. And you have a film that had a potential to boil over into a tremendously tense picture about how fear and stress can turn people into savages. But the film just chooses not to do anything with those angles. There's a scene where the Tanner's children get bullied, two to three scenes of Celia's dad trying to stick it in and being pushed away, and a scene where Mrs. Tanner reveals why her husband lost her job. Then they announce they're moving to Sydney from Victoria, and then they just, well, pack up and leave. I mean, Celia's dad gets outed as an attempted adulterer before they leave, but very little comes about from that. His wife is a bit cold to him for a day or two, but even then she doesn't really seem all that bothered. The Tanners are introduced about 15 to 20 minutes into this film, and are heavily involved in the plot till the end of the second act. When they leave, it's like the film completely forgets they were ever there to begin with. They're never mentioned again, Celia never talks about them, and the adultery angles just dropped entirely. Which left me utterly bereft, because the Tanners were great characters. And I was deeply dissatisfied, because it felt like they were all being put into the film for no reason. Well, if only for one reason at least, which I'll get to shortly. To me, it feels like the film should have ended when the Tanners left but instead we get a third act that's somehow even more disjointed and weird than the rest of the film. So the one reason the Tanners were needed in this film is Celia wants a pet rabbit, and Celia's dad offers to buy her a pet rabbit in exchange for her never speaking to the Tanners again. Which, I mean, it's a dick move, but Celia agrees to that. She doesn't stop talking to the Tanners, but hey, the girl wants a rabbit, the girl gets a rabbit. Throughout the film, Celia and her family are bullied by some local older children who are really quite nasty pieces of work, and the lead bully's dad is the main police officer for that particular area of Victoria. As a result, when Celia tries to get the bully back, the bully informs her father that Celia's picking on her, and the police come down on Celia's family hard. There's a law passed in Australia banning the ownership of rabbits as pets, and Celia, who has, at this point, grown utterly inseparable from her rabbit friend, is asked to give it up. She refuses. So this bully's father makes it his life goal to steal the rabbit and take it to a nearby zoo for safekeeping, which he does while Celia's at school. But she gets home and finds that her rabbit's gone, and she becomes absolutely distraught. After a period of days or weeks, it's not that clear, the laws change to allow permits to own rabbits, and Celia rushes to the zoo to collect her rabbit, only to find it's been drowned. This tips her over the edge, and while playing cowboys and Indians with a gun found in a cupboard, she accidentally, or purposefully, depending on your interpretation, shoots the policeman who took her rabbit dead. In the closing moments of the film, Celia hides all evidence of her involvement, her mum figures out she's the one who killed the policeman but decides to keep it quiet, and Celia and her remaining friends replicate a hanging with one of the kids in a clan hood. The film then abruptly ends, and to say I got immediately pissed off and threw shit about would be an understatement. I was pissed with this film. Not because it wasn't a horror film, but because it seemingly cared so little about my feelings as an audience member that it thought it could waste my time for 1 hour and 42 minutes, resolve nothing, put a load of heavy-handed symbolism in front of me, and leave the characters somehow in less of a developed state than when I found them. I haven't reacted this badly to a film since Rocket Attack USA. And for the following hour and a half that I was awake, I spent it mostly pacing, swearing, and trying to figure out how the hell I was going to write this review, it left me that frustrated. Other than the Tanners, no one in this film is likeable. Not one person. Celia's obnoxious, compulsive, and isn't reasonable, Celia's dad is literally one of the worst human beings on Earth, and the film spends a good chunk of the second and third act trying to make him a redeemable character. Fuck that noise. He ran an entire family out of town and tried to break that same family up. He then tried to bribe his own child and strong-arm his wife into doing what he wanted. He's a dick. End of. Celia's mum is nice, but very one-dimensional and very easily persuaded. And all of the supporting cast are just monsters or horrible people. I wouldn't want to know any of these characters. If I lived in this street, I'd have been begging the Tanners to take me with them for better or worse. I think the main thing this film wants you to come away with is a feeling of being somewhat down, but ultimately with the sense that there's hope out there. 
Think something like This Is England, or maybe even The Devils to a lesser extent. They have massively downer endings, but they at least have history on their side to show things do improve a bit. This film fails in that, and ends in such a way that's confusing and full of hopelessness. Either this film thinks its characters are reasonable, or time has changed so much now that the 1950s centrists of the day are now fascist extremists by modern standards. Even the police murder is played with a sense of, oh god, what have we done? But the police officer was a dick who tried to get Mrs Tanner arrested on erroneous charges and tried to murder Celia's rabbit because his daughter wanted him to. The tension raising between the officer and Celia was one of the only good parts in this hour and three quarter snooze fest. I liked learning about the rabbit plagues in Australia, I liked learning about the fear of the red menace in Australia, because as far as the media goes, it tends to focus way too much on the US, the USSR and the UK rises of communism. That was refreshing. But this film goes about it in such a blunt way that it was dissatisfying, and ultimately, when I get more joy out of reading about communism in Australia from Wikipedia than I did from watching this film, you know you've gone wrong somewhere. The dialogue's pretty naturalistic, but it's just a bit all over the place, honestly. I think that's the nicest thing I can say about this one. It's got good flowing dialogue, even if it isn't really flowing anywhere in particular, there is, however, a real disjointed vibe about how this script plays its scenes out, with there being way too many sequences of Celia and the kids playing in a quarry and not nearly enough attention to pushing the narrative forward for my taste. Equally, a very unusual scene in which Celia and the kids listen to the Tanners having sex in the room next door just left me feeling very uncomfortable. The whole thing is just all over the place, and you're never quite sure which elements you need to latch onto and retain, and which elements you can easily just throw away because they aren't relevant to the plot anymore. The direction and cine are passable for me, the direction's better than expected, and it does look very professional. I'd be interested to see what a Blu-ray remaster could pull out of this film print, in all honesty, but ultimately I can't say I was blown away by anything in particular here. It looks about as good as a picture from this time can look, and with some reasonable experimentation, it does hold my attention. There's some really nice use of character direction with Celia through some of the tougher bullying scenes too, and it's clear that Anne Turner is very good at working with child actors because all the kids here give great performances and really work with the camera rather than against it. But I really think they should have settled on an avenue to explore regarding the imagination sections. They feel kind of forced and pushed in, and they don't really add anything to the plot on the whole. Personally, I'd have either chopped them out or gone the whole hog and explored them more fully, because here, well, it seems half-hearted, which is never good. As mentioned, Dan Turner is the writer and director of this film. It's probably her best-known work in both areas. As a director, she has five credits that are mostly dramas and thrillers, the last one being directed in 2006, and as a writer she has six credits, though these pretty much all are stuff that she's directed too, barring the 1992 feature film Turtle Beach. Again, Celia's probably her best known written work here. Finally, the music. It's nice. It's got a bit of the Channel 4 nighttime vibe about it in terms of its weird and somewhat ominous tones that play throughout. In fact, come to think of it, this film does strike me as something that might have been dumped on nighttime when they had nothing better to screen. It's largely synthesised works, and it's a bit repetitive in honesty, or at least it's working around a particular theme, but it's okay. Nothing outstanding, but it'll do. Celia was released in the UK on VHS in 1990 by BCB. There's a quite fun little line in the copyright warning at the beginning which made me smile, and a single trailer before the film begins, but for the most part, that's your lot. It was then released on DVD by an indie company called Second Run DVD in 2009. This version comes with a few new extras, including an introduction by the film's director and writer, and a brief documentary of collected essays from film critics and historians. And other than that, it's yet to make its way to Blu-ray. The PQ on the VHS version was fine, and I've seen some extracts from the DVD version, which is uncropped, and that looks even better. Though in honesty, apart from a few shots that I think would look nice under Blu-ray conditions, I think a DVD for this one about suffices. 
Ultimately, I think even if Celia hadn't been marketed as a horror movie, I still wouldn't have gotten on with it. The script to me is just way too messy, none of the characters are anywhere near likeable enough for me to care about them when bad things happen, and for all of the pontificating other critics have made about this film representing the loss of childhood innocence, I genuinely couldn't see that in this film. Celia has bad things happen to her, but in the end she's still doing what she was doing at the start of the picture. She's still got the friends she started the movie with, she's still having fun, and she's still got a lively imagination. She's not entirely aware of her actions or the consequences they have, and if anything I left this film feeling that I understood her less as a character than when I went in. Throw in some mediocre directing and writing and a soundtrack that while alright enough, just isn't great, and overall I came away from this one a bit deflated. If you're more into period dramas, your mileage may vary, but personally, for my money, if you're looking for a period drama that shares similar vibes to this film, but actually has its scripting down pat and leaves viewers actually feeling invested, I would recommend something like Once Were Warriors, a New Zealand film that's positively bleak, but also very engaging. I don't watch nearly as many of these kinds of films as I should honestly, I do have an appreciation for them, just not this one. It's taught me a lot about Australian history that I wasn't aware of, but at the same time, I think that's the only reason this film will stick in my head. Ultimately, I can't honestly recommend this one.